Today, I'm walking you through my complete Lightroom Classic editing workflow where you'll get to see exactly how I edit my photos from start to finish. You'll be seeing every single aspect that goes into every single one of my photo edits. And if you wanna to skip to any part of the video, I'm putting the timestamps on screen now so you can do so. All right, without further ado, let's dive into Lightroom. All right, so here we are inside of Lightroom Classic and I have just imported these three shots here. If we open them up, they are all more or less very similar. These are just of some local guy here in Bali, Indonesia, sitting in his mechanic workshop. And uh, I thought the light in here made for a pretty nice scene. Now, one of the hardest choices you'll have to make as a photo editor is what photo do you edit? And I've kind of boiled it down to four aspects of a photo, all in ranking order. So of course, the first one I'm gonna cover is by far the most important. And this really kind of narrows down why I'm choosing a certain image to edit. So the first thing is, is it in focus? Because if it's not in focus, chances are it's not gonna be able to make the cut. And uh, fortunately for all of these images here, he is in focus, which is great. The light's a little bit nicer on this shot. Um, and he's also in focus there. So that ticks that off. Then we're looking at the composition. The composition doesn't really change all that much, aside from this guy, <laughs> aside from this guy in the top right hand corner appearing in just one of the photos. I do prefer the photos without him in it as he is a little bit distracting, but if we do end up choosing this image, it's all right, we should be able to save it and make him not as distracting. Next up on the list is the subject. So as you can see here, we've got a very, very nice smile on the subject's face here, but in this photo, he's kind of like halfway through his smile. And then in this photo, he's completely looking away. I don't mind this photo. This one's probably ruled out as he kind of looks a little awkward here, um, but this smile by far is the best. And then last but not least, how can I achieve the edit that I want from this image? The thing is with these three photos, they're all very similar. They have more or less the exact same composition. So I'm really only looking at the subject here. The last two images here are brighter, which uh, definitely gives them an edge over this image here. However, I much prefer uh, the smile on the subject's face here. So this is the image that we are going to be editing. I know that I'll be able to pull out a good edit from this. I'll probably need a little bit more background and subject isolation uh, as he's kind of blending in right now, but that'll all happen in the edit and later down the track. When I first started editing in Lightroom, I found it really challenging to decide on what photos I did and didn't want to edit. I've kind of boiled it down to these four aspects of a photo and also importing a handful and then copy and pasting the settings over to the other images to kind of see how they will look once I've edited the first shot. But anyway, with that out of the way, we now have a clear idea of the photo that we're gonna be editing. Let's dive in to the develop tab. All right, so first things first, the absolute non-negotiable first step for me when I'm editing is to nail the crop. And this is because I don't wanna put a whole lot of time into an edit and then get to the end of the edit crop and realize I just spent a load of time editing something that's gonna get cropped out anyway. So. The first question you've got to ask yourself is where is this image going? Of course, if you don't want to play by Instagram's rules, for example, and upload a four by five image, you don't have to. You could upload it like this. You could upload 16 by nine, do as you please. With that being said, I've fallen in love with widescreen crops and that's what we're going to do today. I'm not really going to be posting this image on Instagram. I'm probably going to be using it for the thumbnail of this video, but if I were to just export this image and have it sit on my hard drive or even get it printed, I would be cropping in 2.35 by one. I find this an incredibly cinematic crop ratio, if you will. And um, I've even got the crop lines baked onto all of the photos that I take on my A7C Mark II, just so I'm able to nail the composition when I'm out shooting for this exact crop ratio. So what we're gonna do is open up the crop tool here, and then I'm gonna hit this drop down menu right here. And then if I didn't already have 2.35 by one already preset into my Lightroom, I could enter it here and then I would have it preset. But since I've already entered it and you can see I uh, made a few mistakes when I was first getting used to this crop, I'm gonna click on 2.35 by one. And now I have got probably probably the crop that works the best for this image. And the reason it works so well is because I shot with that crop overlay and I composed it for this exact shot. So now that we've got the crop overlay sorted, I'm now gonna look at straightening up the lines. Usually I look at using poles and walls in the background to work out if things are straight or not. But since this photo was shot in very rural and remote Indonesia, chances are their walls and poles might not be 100% straight and level. So I've kind of just got to rough it with my eyes and take a little bit of initiative to kind of find where things look 
fairly horizontal and I think I've nailed it. Looking at this truck over here, it looks like it's parked somewhat straight now, so I'm happy with the crop. By the way, if your crop tool looks a little different and it doesn't look like these weird crosses, you can cycle through your crop overlays by pressing O. There's a handful of them, maybe like 15 of them, but I have found by far that this crop overlay here is definitely the one for me. So we're gonna hit enter on that. And now that our image is cropped, we can move into the fun stuff. All right, so as I mentioned when we were selecting this photo, this is a little bit more of a dark photo compared to the other ones we had to choose from. So we're gonna dive into the basic tab here and start correcting the exposure and the white balance. First things first is I'm gonna crank that exposure up just a little bit to lift the entire shot up a touch. I'm then gonna do the same with the shadows just so we can really start to see what is going on. And if things start to look flat, don't freak out. We're gonna be able to add a whole load of contrast back in later in the tone curve and through our masking. So right now, all I'm doing is making sure I can see everything in the shot and then I'll be able to make my adjustments accordingly. So I can see since I increased my exposure, our highlights are starting to get a little bit too bright. So we might also bring those down a little bit, saving a little bit of detail on that door and in the leaves up in the top left corner. But now we have a much more balanced Balanced image. If I hit the before and after key, which is the backslash key when you're in the develop tab, you can see that things are far better exposed and they sort of somewhat match these ones. They're even a little bit brighter. Like I said, we'll be able to add all that contrast in in just a moment. So I'm happy with how the exposure is looking and we're gonna leave it like that. This is a little bit more of a darker, moodier shot. So I'm happy to kind of lean into that and not try to make this image something that it's not. I'm gonna be leaving the contrast slider as is here as well, as I find that you don't get too much control when you're just boosting or decreasing the contrast slider. So I'm leaving it as is. Now that we can see everything in the image, we can move into the white balance slider. Things are a little bit warm, sure, uh, but I think we're gonna lean into that. This was shot really early morning, so with that beautiful golden light, and if we back this off just a touch, things, I think things get far too cold far too quickly. So I actually really like the look of the white balance in this shot, and I'm happy with how things are looking. Now, still in the basic tab here, but has nothing to do with exposure, more or less. We're gonna move into the present section down here. We're gonna be leaving vibrance and saturation as is. We'll be able to control that all later on in the HSL tab. But texture, clarity, and dehaze are super powerful tools. Now, this was shot on the A7C Mark II with the 24 millimeter F2.8. Definitely a sharp setup. And as you can see, things are very, very sharp. And I like that. However, since this was shot really early morning, I wanna give a little bit more of a dreamier vibe, and I'm gonna be able to do that to the entire shot simply just by dropping the clarity a little bit. If we zoom in here on our subject's face and we just drop the clarity just a little bit, you can start to see that things don't particularly get unsharp, let's say, but they do get a little softer, and I really like that look. Now, if we zoom back out, you can also see up in the top here, the highlights where things are really bright, are starting to look very nice as well. If I reset this, you can see that it's real contrasty and it kind of looks a little bit sharper. But if I just drop that clarity a little bit, things look a little softer. They look a little nicer. Definitely not film-esque, but definitely moving towards that vibe and taking a little bit of that digital edge off. Now I'm gonna leave the rest of the presence tab as is. The dehaze tool is gonna make things either a little bit too dark and moody or a little bit too bright and washed out. So I'm just gonna leave that as is for now. And the texture slider, I'm not really looking to sharpen anything else in our photo, at least until we get to the sharpening tool. So for now, I'm gonna leave it as is and we can move on into the tone curve. Now the tone curve is full of craziness. One little move and your image can look completely different. You also have four tone curves to play with. You have the blue, the green, the red, and then of course you have the RGB curve. I'm only gonna be playing with the RGB curve here. I never really use the red, green, or blue curves as I much prefer to dial in my colors in the HSL, color grading, and color calibration tools later on. So for now, we're only gonna be playing with the RGB point curve. What I'm gonna do, first things first, is just put three points on the tone curve. I have a full video breaking down exactly how the tone curve works, but just as a quick crash course, in case you haven't watched that video, pretty much this is the blacks, this is the whites, and then these three dots that I've placed here, this intersection right here is the shadows, this cross intersection here is the mid-tones, and this cross intersection here is the highlights. So dragging this down or up is going to affect that part of the shot. So for example, the shadows here, if I drag this down, things get a little darker, but I don't want to do that all that much because 
Like I said before, I'm very happy with the overall exposure of this image. So we're not gonna be playing with the tone curve all that much. With that said though, let's start off in the shadows. I am gonna move this down just a touch, not too much, just a little bit. We are gonna move those midtones up a little bit more than we drop those shadows though. And then I'm gonna pair that up by just lifting the highlights ever so slightly. Now this has more or less not done too much to our shot, but it's added a little bit of contrast back into it because of course we took it out up here to see exactly what we were working with. And I really like the way this shot is starting to look. Something I do with pretty much all of my photos is raise the blacks. And this is just gonna give a subtle fade over the entire image kind of leaning on that film-esque look again, like we did with the clarity slider. Of course, completely different tools, completely different results, but that's the kind of look that I'm kind of going for in this shot. So just raising those blacks a little bit kind of fades out all the darker parts of the shot, and I really like the way that looks. And then you can do the same thing with the highlights and the whites by just dropping this ever so slightly. The main part that we'll kind of see that affecting is up here. So for example, if we pop that back up, you can see they're a little bit more rich and punchy. And if I drop it down, you can see they fade out. So we want something not too noticeable, just a little bit, we're gonna fade that out. And I think things are looking quite good. Now I wanna show you just what the tone curve has been able to do to this image. So if you wanna just see what one specific tool did, you can come over to the little eye next to the name of the tool that you wanna see, and then just click and hold. And you can see that is before we use the tone curve and that is after we use the tone curve. Things are a little bit more richer. Things have kind of come to life a little bit more. And I find that when I'm editing my photos, that is the main point of the tone curve to just make the images come alive. Now, I absolutely love the point color tool when it came out. I thought it was incredible. However, I do find it a little bit finicky to use. So for now, we're just gonna stick with the traditional hue, saturation, and luminance sliders. I find it far quicker and easier to use the HSL sliders instead of you know going through and creating your own HSL slider with the point curve. This is just far more efficient. So something I try and do in all my photos is tone down very prominent colors. Now, since this was shot at golden hour, there's quite a lot of yellow in this image and I really don't like yellow in my shots. So one thing I'm gonna do, first thing I'm gonna do is dive into the saturation tab and just back off those yellows. And just really in the background, a little bit on this truck, it's gonna start to dial down that yellowish hue in the background. Now we're not gonna go crazy as then part of the truck is gonna go gray, but we are just going to back them off a little bit. I find that that's the key to editing in Lightroom. It's not going crazy by, you know, cranking the sliders to 100. It's purely just tiny little effects that you make, tiny little changes that you make, and then they compound to make a complete edit later on. So that's what we're gonna do here. I'm gonna make those yellows probably a little bit more orange as well by moving the yellow hue over to the orange side, just a touch. And then we can look at probably backing off those oranges as well. I think the orange is definitely a main color in this shot since it's our subject's skin tone. So backing that off just a little bit kind of helps balance out the shot a little bit more. Now, obviously this guy in the background here is very bright and very saturated, but we will be able to reduce his prominence in the photo, if you will, during our masking workflows. So for now, we're not really gonna focus on him. We're only focusing on our subject right here. Now, another color I wanna back off just a little bit is the red. And that is because we have quite a lot of red in the background here, and then a little bit of red on our subject's shirt. So if we back that off all the way, it doesn't look all that great, but we are gonna back off the saturation, which is like the intensity of the color. And we're gonna just make that a little bit more subtle. And then we're gonna start making our first luminance change, which is how bright or how dark a color is. And what I'm gonna do is just drop the luminance of the red. It helps add a little bit more contrast and it helps this stand out a little bit less as well. And I find that dropping the luminance of certain colors can really start to add a nice level of contrast back into your shot in a completely different way. Now looking at this photo, I'm actually really happy with the colors. Sometimes the HSL workflow can get out of hand and it gets crazy. But for now, I think we're gonna leave it as is as I don't wanna make too many changes to my shot. Something I always do as well is to make sure that I'm looking at a before and after while I'm editing. And like I said before, all that's gonna do is a backslash. So this is where we've started and this is where we are right now. Still a little bit flat, but give me some time and I promise when we're in the masking workflow, things are gonna come alive. Now moving on to the color grading tool here, this is where we can push and pull colors into certain parts of our image. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. First up on the chopping block is our shadows. Now looking at the shadows here, we have a few warm tones, I would say, 
but definitely a few cool tones as well. And that is how we're going to lean into this color grading workflow. We're just gonna add a little bit of blue into the shadows, not too much. Once again, I find that when I'm editing, I'm only making tiny little adjustments. So we're only increasing the saturation by seven here, which is you know hardly anything. But if I turn color grading off and back on, you can see there's just a little hint of blue in the shadows now. And I find that helps balance out our shot. The highlights I'm gonna leave as is. And then for our mid-tones, I'm not sure whether I wanna add warmer or cooler tones into this shot. So I'm just gonna boost up the saturation a little bit, kind of check out our warm tones here. And then I'm gonna flip this over to the blue. Definitely prefer it on the warmer side there. And then we're just gonna back off our saturation ever so slightly, a little before and after on our color grading. It's super subtle, but it's definitely these tiny little changes that all add up to a great edit. And then we're gonna do the same on the color mixer tool here because I didn't do that before. So that's before and after, things are definitely looking solid. So I'm happy with that color grading. I'm gonna leave it as is, and we're gonna move on to detail. I'm not a fan of over sharpened images at all, but if you do wanna add a little bit of sharpening to your shot, please do yourself a favor and mask out your sharpening. If you have no masking involved whatsoever, that means if you just crank this sharpening slider, everything in your image is masked evenly. That's a good way to put it. It's masked evenly and that's not ideal. So to use the masking tool, if you just move this back and forward, you don't see any change. But if you hold down option on a Mac, or I believe it's alt on Windows, you can drag this and then all of a sudden as you increase masking, only things in white will be masked, everything else in black will be left as is as you shot it. So for example, I could crank this all the way to 100 and then only the little parts on our subject's face, some of the truck and then a little bit in the little shop behind the subject just here get uh, sharpened. So right now for this image, we might back that up to like 85 and then we could just increase the sharpening a little bit. If we zoom in on our subject's face, look at before, and after, you can see just a little bit, we might increase our sharpening ever so slightly. I'm not gonna go over the top here, where this is a minuscule. I mean, our masking is at 85. We're hardly selecting any of the image. We're just making these tiny, tiny little changes. All right, moving on to noise reduction. This is a really effective tool when you're not shooting at 100 ISO. So for me, we're moving on from that. But if you're images full of noise, you can either use the AI noise reduction, which is an incredible tool, or if you just have a little bit of noise, increasing the luminance just a touch can really help out. Okay, let's skip over that. If you don't have your profile corrections for your lens already set up, you can do so here. And to kind of see what I mean by that, if I take that off, you can see that there's a lot of warping that gets corrected when I enable this. So either make sure that's done by default, or you go in here, you choose your lens if Lightroom's got it. They've got loads of lenses in here. Um, and that's just gonna help kind of give your image a little bit more of a true to life feeling and take out that fisheye warp if you're shooting really wide. Now, unless I'm shooting in a city where there's a load of tall buildings, or I made a mistake on the angle that I was holding my camera app when I was taking a photo. I don't usually touch the transform tool. If things look a little bit off or a little bit skewed or a little bit weird, you can fix it in here. But luckily this is a pretty basic photo. It's just shot straight down the lens. So I don't need to touch it at all. I'm happy with how things are looking. Lens blur, I'm really happy with how the 2.8 aperture looked here. I'm not a huge fan of adding artificial blur, even though Lightroom's tool is incredibly effective. I don't wanna add all that much blur into this shot. I think the 2.8 aperture on the full frame sensor looks great. So I'm also gonna leave that as is. The effects here, at least for the vignetting, I'm also gonna leave that as is. We're gonna put all our vignetting in in our masking workflow, which is coming up very soon. I know I've been talking about that a lot, but we are gonna add just a slight amount of grain in here. I find that adding grain, especially in street photos like this, give them so much character, feeling and vibe. So all we've got to do for that is just increase our grain a little bit. And then we can zoom in to, for example, this kind of shaded area down here, because this is probably where we're going to see the most grain. If I crank that up like crazy, I feel like it stands out in the darker parts versus the lighter parts. But what we're going to do is I don't want it to be too crazy. So I'm going to just decrease the size a little bit, decrease the roughness a touch. And then of course, we're going to pull this back a lot. Okay, maybe increase the rough, roughness just a little bit, just like that. Okay, I would say things are looking good. A little before and after on the effects. Yeah, I like that grit that it gives. I think things are looking tasty. And we're now down to the bottom of our develop tab. Wow, 
There you go. So camera calibration is a little bit of a strange tool, but I'll give you a quick rundown of how it works. It's pretty much you're telling Lightroom, interpret blue colors as a little bit more green or a little bit more purple. And this also is a flow and effect to every other color in the image. It's more or less affecting the entire color science of your camera. So please tread with caution, just like every other slider inside of Lightroom. If you've seen other calibration slider workflows, you'll know that 99% of the time people push to the left, people push to the right, and then choose what way they want to go. And that's exactly what I do as well. I find it fast, I find it efficient, and of course, I find it effective. So let's start with the blue primary. Let's go to the left, let's go to the right. By far the left is much stronger than the right is, at least in my taste. And then we can look at boosting the saturation, maybe just a touch here. I would say the blue primary is gonna be the main kind of driver of what gets this image over the line. I'm gonna do the same with the green here, definitely over to the right, saturation. I would say a little bit more saturated, things are looking good. And then red primary, I'm gonna leave that as is. Maybe saturation, I'm gonna leave the saturation for that as well. And then the tint, we might just cool it off a little bit and put it into the greens. So that is the develop tab knocked over. I think things are looking very tasty. But before we move on to our masking workflow, a quick before and after, I think this shot is starting to really, really take place, which is great because now we move on to what I think is the most effective part of photo editing, which is our masking workflow. Things are gonna get a little bit crazy. We're gonna add a load of masks into this masking workflow. So strap in and uh, yeah, enjoy the process. So first things first, I have been wanting to do this the entire time we've been editing, and that is to dial back the saturation on this guy right here. First thing, I'm going to press O, and that's gonna hide the mask overlay. You can also do it here, but a cheeky little keyboard shortcut never goes astray. So first things first, I'm gonna drop the exposure on him so he stands out a little less, and I'm also gonna drop the saturation just a touch as well. I don't wanna pull it off too far, so then it becomes another level of distracting. So I wanna keep it somewhat realistic, but I definitely wanna desaturate him. I think things are looking somewhat good, maybe just decrease the highlights a touch. And now I'm really only focused in on our subject. I'm now gonna add a radial gradient over the entire image. So we're just gonna pull that over like this. And then I'm gonna come up to the top here and click invert. Now we've selected the outside of our subject, which is perfect because now we get to drop our exposure just a touch. Now this is gonna really help our subject stand out from the background simply just by darkening the corners and making it a little bit more focused on him has already transformed the image. I'm loving how that looks. And now we can add another radial gradient in here, which is gonna help our subject stand out even more. We're gonna add it over our highlighted area where the light is kind of coming from. And then we're gonna open up these dots here. And then we're gonna intersect our mask with a luminance range. The idea here is I only wanna select the bright parts of this highlight area, right? I don't wanna select all the dark parts because what I'm about to do is make that bright part even brighter to accentuate where that light is coming from. So to remove all the darker parts of that mask, I'm just gonna slowly increase this. And because my mask overlay is on, you can already see it in the truck right here. The more I increase this, the less gets selected in the dark parts of the image, right? So we really only wanna select up the top where it is nice and bright. So that's definitely all selected there. Uh, I would say that is probably pushing it a little bit. Okay, yeah, remove majority of that truck there. That is looking good. Now if I press O, obviously now we can't see where that is. But now if I just increase, increase the uh, exposure just a little bit, not only increasing the exposure though, we also want to decrease the dehaze to actually add haze. Then we also want to decrease the clarity a little bit as well. And then if I turn this off and back on, you can see it's quite, it's quite noticeable. There's quite a big change, but it just kind of adds a little bit more of another layer to our shot and really accentuates where that light is coming from. Now, I'll be honest, I don't think I'm in love with how the, um, with how the truck door came out. So I'm gonna open up the mask again, intersect it with a brush. I'm gonna press O so I can see where I have selected. I'm gonna hit the invert key and now I get to remove where I don't want it to be selected, where I don't want the mask to be masking. So we're gonna come in here and we're just gonna remove this entire truck as I do not want it being affected by that mask and getting even brighter. 
There we go, if I press O. Okay, things are now looking a lot nicer. I much prefer how that looks. All right, now fortunately, this image doesn't need too much of a crazy edit, and we're just gonna start to make our subject pop even harder from our shot. That's pretty much the entire idea of my masking workflow, is to just make our subject bang. So what we have here is a gradient filter that is coming from the right-hand side. I'm just gonna drop the exposure a little bit to kind of mute out that right side of our shot. I'm gonna create another mask, hit select subject. Hopefully the, uh, yep, Lightroom AI absolutely nailed that, brilliant. We can increase the exposure on our subject just a touch, nothing too crazy, because if you go like that, and things just look incredibly fake. So we just wanna increase it just a little bit, like 0.18 is what we're increasing it by, so that's perfect. And now I'm gonna to come to these dots and hit duplicate and invert. So what that's now gonna do is select behind and everything around our subject. And what we can do there is I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna intersect this mask with a brush I'm gonna click invert, so now we're subtracting. I'm gonna come up to the highlighted area that we selected before to make sure this is not affected because what we're about to do is decrease the exposure around our subject to help him stand out once again. I feel like a broken record at this stage. So we're just gonna decrease the exposure just a little bit, nothing too crazy. If we have a look at before that mask and after, just kind of helps him stand out a little bit more. And then before and after this mask, helps him stand out a little bit more. And guys, I would have to say, I think we're pretty much done. If we have a look at before and after, this has completely transformed. I would say maybe just the mask that we had on our subject here, if I put 0.05, I think it was a little, a little bit too bright and this one might've been a little bit too dark. Okay, I'd say that's looking far, far better. I, <laughs> This always happens. I always think I'm finished with the edit and then we come back in. And you know what? Sometimes you just need a little time away from the edit and then come back and have a look. Obviously I haven't had that, but even that 30 seconds of like, hey guys, the video's over. Well, guess what? It's definitely not over because I think he's now a little bit too saturated. So we're gonna click on the mask that has selected him and we're just gonna desaturate it, uh, desaturate him, I should say. Just a little bit, nothing too crazy. And now I'm pretty happy with that. And guys, that is more or less the entire Lightroom Classic workflow. I would then go into Photoshop. I would right click our photo here, hit edit in and go to Photoshop. And then I would take out this little, this little mark on the tile. I might even look at removing this kind of washed away poster, maybe these little tiny oil marks under the truck and really help us just focus in on our subject and we'd be done. But thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you've been able to learn a thing or two about Lightroom Classic and how you can edit your photos in Lightroom Classic. If you're new around here, a subscribe would mean the absolute world. If you've made it this far and you can't be bothered to edit your photos, go and check out my Lightroom presets below this video. But thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.